Amen. Amen. If you would get your Bibles and turn to the book of Jude, and you also take your paper out. Now, this is like the third or fourth week we've started this, Brother Aiken. We, <clears throat> you, um, no doubt, is going to jump right into the pulpit here soon. And uh, what it's my favorite thing to do uh, as a as a pastor. But I love the midweek service because it's our people, and we get to learn the Word of God. And what we started doing is we started. Uh, handing out something it's almost like a fill in the blank now some people when i first handed it out they started convulsing they thought i was giving them a test some of them hadn't had a test i looked at ray ivy and ray said i ain't i don't know how to take a test on that <laughs> and uh but that's not what it is it's just you following along um and really it's your way of uh, maybe keeping up with the notes a little bit and uh so if you um everybody got a pen or need in need of a pen if not um, Brother Tony can get you one, but I think everybody's got a pen. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and start in the book of Jude. Now, I may, I may um, just rehash, but let me, uh, let me go back to um, <clears throat> uh, Jude chapter number, or see, not chapter, verse 22 and 23, and uh, Jude 22 and 23, and look at it, if you would. And if some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, this is what we talked about last week, so it's not on your sheet. I'll get to that in just a minute. But you remember the servant's duty is what we talked about last week, and we talked about compassion, what compassion is and uh, what it what it ain't. And uh, I want you to notice the indwelling compassion. It said, and some have compassion, making a difference. I said last week, compassion is a must if we are to survive and be fruitful in these last days. Now, you understand, Jude was written right before Revelation. It's very relevant to today. The whole Bible is relevant to what we got today. But Jude is giving us some instruction before the rapture. And he's warning us of apostates, and he's warning of us of, of uh, a, a coldness, and he's still telling us that, that you can have compassion uh, but without compassion, you will not be fruitful. And so we we spoke about that a little bit last week. And God is our example of such love. I, I told you in Psalms 86, 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion. So God's compassionate. Therefore, you and I should be compassionate. And uh, some areas that we should be this indwelling compassion. I said, number one, we must love our Savior. We must love our Savior. Uh, that's where compassion begins. You can't love the sinner without loving the Savior. Why? Because He first loved us. Amen? Amen? So we ought to love them. And uh, many failures come because of insufficient love for Christ. And we know that. Most people, the reason they don't read their Bibles is because they don't love the Lord. Now that's a harsh statement, but it's a true statement. Uh, the reason why most people don't pray is not because they're lazy it's because they don't love God enough. If you love God, you'll pray. If you love God, you'll read your Bible. Now that's really, really kindergarten, but it's, it's a profound truth that the reason most people are not soul conscious is because they do not love Christ. The reason why most people are not faithful to church is because they just, there's no, it's not, they've got things above the Lord. And uh, so we, we, it's a very, it, well, John fourteen fifteen. if you love me, keep my commandments. Paul didn't say that. No, that's, that's, that's Christ. Uh, if you love me, keep my commandments. And, uh, uh, and then Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, he told that church, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. So can we lose our first love? Can we leave it? Absolutely. Absolutely, we can leave it. And we talked about that last week. And then we must love the sinner, not just the Savior, but we ought to love the sinner. Hey, a good example of that is going out on Saturdays, going out through the week. Hey, at the grocery store, at the bank, at the restaurant, at the, you know, wherever, and handing out a gospel track. We saw the impact that it made. Even I heard the phone calls this week. Hey, uh, preacher, thank you for having people coming. We needed it. Hey, you know what that is? That's compassion for the sinner. It's compassion for the sinner. And we ought to have that. We ought to have that. One of our biggest problems in these last days is our lack of love for one another. How about our, our, we must love the saint. 
Not just the Savior, not just the sinner, but the saint. You know what a lot of churches are guilty of? Uh, they'll have some homeless man walk down the middle of the aisle and they'll love on him, but they'll fight with their fellow church members. Can't get along with each other, but they, they'll love that homeless man and help him. Well, that's good, but if you're not getting along with the other, if a deacon's at odds with another deacon, well, that God ain't going to bless that. Amen. So churches shouldn't be fighting and squabbling. If the church is has compassion and they're going after sinners like they should be, then that church ain't going to be arguing with each other. Amen. May that be Bible Baptist Church, not just now. May that be Bible Baptist Church in five years, ten years, where we can look back and say, to God be the glory, we've not had fighting and fussing, and people standing up or people uh, even not, not, maybe not in the auditorium, but out here and leaving because they're at odds with another family. Listen, folks, if you're going to leave, uh, you know, don't, don't leave because you're mad at another family. Oh, my goodness. Hey, don't do that. Hey, you shouldn't leave your church, period, but unless God calls you out. But you shouldn't leave because you can't get along. That's not biblical. That's not biblical. And by the way, it's not compassion either. It's not compassion then we see immediate concern in Jude 23. He said, others save with fear. Uh, others save with fear. Uh, so it takes more than compassion to reach this crowd. This crowd is on their way to hell. And we need to go after them. Folks, I believe last week we, we dwelt on this, but the preaching on hell is no longer, people just don't, preachers don't preach on hell anymore. It used to be that a preacher would come in here and would preach back in the 60s and the 70s, and they'd actually show videos called the burning hell. My daddy, uh, listen, my dad was so uh, so fired up uh, over seeing my grandpa. Uh, my grandpa, listen, was an old drunk, and 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 up until 15 years ago, he, he was lost. He got saved. My dad was so burdened for my grandpa that he he invited my grandpa to go see the burning hell at church. An old video. And a reel to reel back in the day, they'd set that reel to reel up and watch it up on on that on that little pull up screen. And my dad was so burdened for my my grandpa to be saved that he invited my granddad to church, and my granddad promised him he'd go, and then he didn't go. And so my dad said, "Well, I ain't I ain't letting that stop me." So my dad got that reel to reel and that screen and went to my grandpa's house and set it up in the living room. And made my grandpa watch it. Now grandpa didn't get saved, but my dad sat there and cried as my grandpa watched that video praying. By the way, it didn't just happen. He didn't get saved that night, but he got saved years later. And all them seeds that was sown was reaped. And it was harvested. And so don't listen. Uh, that's the kind, My grandpa was a hard case. There's going to be hard cases out here. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to knock on their door and we're going to say, Hey, uh, we want to invite you to Bible Baptist, but more importantly than even coming to church is do you know Christ as your Savior? They're going to look at you sometimes and say, I don't want that, but should we stop? No, because compassion doesn't stop. Compassion keeps going. Compassion keeps going. Jude said pulling them out of the fire. What fire is he talking about? The fire of hell. Hellfire. Now, listen, here's what I believe. This is crazy. Uh, some of you may look at me and say, I don't, but I believe this goes all the way back to Korah, where Korah had rebelled against God. And you remember, because Korah is mentioned in Jude now. Don't, don't, don't look at me too crazy. <laughs> Korah is mentioned in Jude. If you don't believe me, then look at it. In verse number. Uh, 11, it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished after the gainsaying of Korah. That's Korah in, in the Old Testament. Now, the earth swallowed up Korah for rebellion, standing up against God's man, Moses. His family suffered. Okay? His kids, his family, they were all dropping into hell. I can only imagine as they're dropping off into hell, them Israelites that love Korah's family and them little kids, I can see some of them Israelites running over there and grabbing some of those kids and pulling them out of the fire. Mm -hmm. Now you say, preacher, I don't see that in there. I don't either. But I do see that in that verse there in verse number 23 because it says, another saved with fear pulling them out of the fire. 
could it be that as Kor's family was falling into hell, some of them Israelites standing along the side said, you know what? I'd like to save some of them. Now, we can apply this to today, of course. Because again, I may get to heaven and I think that's pretty neat, but I might get to heaven and stand corrected that no, that ain't what happened. But it's exactly what we do on Saturdays. There's people literally falling and going to hell out here in our community on their way to hell and we can stand out there and pull them literally out of the, off the slick road to hell on their way to heaven by showing them that Jesus loved and died for them. Amen. We can be, we can be those that are pulling them out of the fire. Just one accident and hell becomes their eternal abode. We know that. Luke 16, 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God in Psalms 9, verse 17. One of the great tragedies of the day is that hell is growing and churches are dying. And it is. And then lastly, and I did not get to this last week, but I want you to look at it. It's not on your sheet yet, so I'm getting there. I want you to notice the insidious contamination. Look at verse number 23 again. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Hating even the garment spotted by flesh. So Jude, he warns us about the possibility of defilement that we need to be aware of dealing with these apostates. Jude says, I don't even want my garment spotted. You say, well, preacher, what's Jude talking about? Well, over in the book of Leviticus chapter 13, uh, the priest would burn, I don't have time to read all these verses, but Leviticus 13 says that the priest, if they saw contamination from a leper that had that spot on his robe and they could not, it was literally leprosy and they found that it was leprosy, they had to burn his garments. They burned his garments. And what Jude was saying is, hey, we, even, we need to hate the garment that's even spotted by the flesh. Meaning that that little sin as leprosy that starts out so small is a sin that, well, it's a, it, it's a flesh-eating cancer. And he says, I even hate the garment. So the teaching here is that we must hate apostasy and error, but love those that are caught up in it. <clears throat> kind of teaches us that we ought to hate the sin but love the sinner. Hate that. The, the false teaching, but yet love that soul in whom Christ died for. So sin and apostasy are serious problems and we must take the greatest caution in dealing with them unless, unless we be defiled. So can I let an apostate teach a Sunday school class? No, I can't. Now, can I love him? Is he welcome to sit right there and listen to me preach? You better believe it. I'll love him. I'll go down there and shake hands with him. I'll eat lunch with him. But he ain't teaching in this church. Anything to do with people, I can't let him. Why? He's dangerous. He's dangerous. Now, is he welcome to come to church? Absolutely. But he ain't going to give a silent prayer. Not here. Because I can't let an apostate creep in the church because what they'll do is, we've learned these last five months, they'll corrupt your church. They'll sow division. So if a man here, I know he don't like me, if I know that he don't like my preaching, but he sits there, he can sit there. I'll love him and I'll pray for him and I'll love his family. But I can't let him do anything because he's bad news for the church. That's what Jude's talking about. I love the church more than I, I love some guy over here that's mad at me or, or he hates what I'm teaching. You know, I've had him come and preacher, I, don't, I ain't King James only. Or I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, even, a, even more dangerous than that is I believe... Uh, you know this or that, and I, I believe that salvation's this. I mean, folks, we got to be. Listen, we got to. We just got to have a backbone uh, and stand up to these things, and just get concrete in our shoes and say, I don't care what wind blows through here. I'm not wavering. Amen. Amen? And we have a backbone and not uh, and not uh, let everything go. Now, I want you. I want to give you some things. Look at verse 24 and 25, and I'm and these are not long at all, and that's kind of why I spent just a little bit more time on our. Last, um, last lesson. Notice the Savior's defense. Look at verses 24 and 25. Now unto him that is able. Well, these are encouraging, encouraging verses to end. 
to keep you from falling. Ain't you glad that He's able to keep you from falling? Amen. And to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. You know, if Jude would have ended on verse 23, it had been kind of depressing a little bit, wouldn't it? But Jude had to say, you know what, though? I'm going to point you to the one, the Savior. And I want you to notice some things. Notice the preservation from falling. Notice that. The preservation. I believe that's on maybe on your sheet there. The preservation from falling. Look at verse 24 again. It's a wonderful assurance. Now notice, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. I want you to notice this. God's people are a preserved people. God's people are a preserved people. We're preserved in Jesus Christ. Uh, John 10, 28 says, and uh, we, I like these last three words in John 10, 28. It says, And I give unto you eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Hey, anytime anybody doubts it, hey, can I lose my salvation or can somebody rob me of my salvation? Or can, Hey, I always point them to John 10. Hey, uh, listen, if, if you could lose your salvation, then that's taken away from Christ. Amen. It's taken away from His all power and all glory. And you'd be surprised at how many people have a problem with eternal security. I mean, good people. Good people. And if you do, I have patience with you. And I promise you, I'll love you and teach you uh, what's right according to the Bible. But I, I'll say this. You know what? I, I would hate to have a salvation that I could lose. Now, some people look at it on the other side and they say, well, preacher, that's, you know, there's some people that we just do things that we know uh, that we, um, that, you know, you're saying that we can be saved and not do anything to lose our salvation. That's exactly what I said. There's exactly what I said. You know, uh, in, in uh, uh, nothing, you know, notice this, nothing can separate the believer from the love of Christ. Nothing, notice that on your paper, nothing can separate the believer from the love of Christ. Notice what Jude said in verse 25. He said, uh, it's, it's a source of security. He said, the only wise God, our Savior. Psalms 37 verse 24, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. So who, who upholds us? Who keeps us from falling? The Lord does. Our only Savior, the Lord. He keeps us from falling. How many times would we have fell if Jesus wasn't there to keep us upright and, and, uh, and keep us from falling? So we know that our Lord, He keeps us from falling. Uh, so we see uh, the preservation from falling. Number two, I want you to notice the presentation in faultlessness. The presentation in faultlessness. Notice what Jude says in verse 24 again. Jude says that Christ will notice this present you faultless before the presence of His glory, notice, with exceeding joy. With exceeding joy. Hey, that word faultless is the same word that uh, Peter uses to describe Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, that's that word faultless that Jude uses is the same word that that Peter uses that hey not one not one uh, uh, blemish or without spot and uh, I praise God for that that we're going to be presented spotless. By the way, that goes to show the power of Jesus Christ. We're not going to get to heaven and be presented and have a bunch of scars of sin on us and a bunch of things of the past. Hey, no, we're going to be perfectly presented as spotless, faultless. Uh, uh, sons of God. And I'm thankful. First John chapter 3 and verse 2, Beloved, we are the sons of God, and doth not yet it, uh, doth not appear what we shall be. But we know that when we, He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. God the Father's desire for every believer will be realized at last. God the Father's desire for every believer will be realized at last. So we'll know when we get to heaven what the desire of the Father was for us. 
will be presented without blemish and without spot. Uh, and then we see in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he did also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we have a presentation in faultlessness. Now, folks, listen, we're, we're a bunch of old wicked sinners down here. I mean, that's really what we are. Ain't none of us better than anybody. We're all saved by grace. But one day when we stand before God, hey, we're going to be faultless before Him. Amen? And all them things, listen, all them things of the past, there'll be no more. And uh, there ain't going to be no drugs in heaven. Not, and by the way, I don't even think there's going to be any former drug addicts. That ain't going to follow you in heaven. You're going to be, by the way, a new name written down in glory. Amen. We ain't going to have the same name. Amen. According to the Bible, it's going to be a new name. So I praise the Lord for that. The, God's, the Father's desire for every believer will be realized at last. Then I want you to notice number three, the praising of God forever. Notice what Jude says. I like how he ends the book of Jude. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. And then he puts, Amen. Amen. He even agrees with what he said. Amen. He even puts the vine. Hey Amen. On it. why? Because he's a, he's liking what he wrote. Amen. He's liking what the Holy Holy Spirit wrote. Amen. And he he puts it out. Hey Amen. What both now and forever. I want three. I want to give you three or four things right here that I I put on that sheet about the praising of God forever. And I praise the Lord for this. I want you to notice the unwavering Christian is a praising Christian. The unwavering Christian is a praising. Christian. Christian. You know, unwavering meaning you're just constant. You're unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You're there. But you ought to be praising God. I'm talking about not just at church uh, where it's sometimes easy to praise the Lord. Uh, man, if you couldn't praise the Lord Sunday morning when Brother Carr was preaching and singing, this, your praisers broke. Amen. <laughs> Something ain't right. Yeah, you know, uh, man, that was a blessing. His singing and his wife, his his little girl, and, and then the preaching, and then Sunday night. If you couldn't get excited about it, then something's wrong. But okay, let's put Sunday aside. Are you praising God throughout the week? Are you praising God throughout the week? Are you praising Him for blessings that He's doing? Praising. So the unwavering Christian is a praising Christian. Praise God. Praise God. You ought to just, that ought to be in your vocabulary. Praise God. Praise God. Not praise me. Not praise the pastor. Uh, not praise somebody. Praise God. Why? He deserves it. He deserves it. Hey, the more you praise God, the more you'll find to be unwavering in your walk with the Lord. Then, number two, it is the duty of the Christian to praise God. It's the duty of the Christian. Now, as much as I not really crazy about the word duty as far as the Christian goes because again we got to be that, that sounds sometimes like oh I got to do it no I ain't really what I'm talking about we are we are really commanded to praise God as the Christian we are commanded uh, it, it is the duty of the Christian to praise God meaning that we ought to give back to God the praise that he deserves so if somebody brags on you and says hey good job or Man, great, or man, that blessed me, or man, that was a... You ought to say, you know what? Praise the Lord. What are you saying? I'm directing anything that would puff my head up back to the Lord. I had a preacher call me this morning, and he, 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 uh, he's a great, he is a great friend. He's a hero, really. He's a little older than I am. And uh, he, he was kind of, he called me this morning to... Uh, to uh, really correct me, you know, in, in something. Uh, and I hadn't talked to him. And I said, man, I hadn't talked to you in like, you know, seven months. And the first thing, you're, you're calling me to correct me about something, you know. But he was just keeping me in line. I, I don't know even, you know, really what he was saying. Um, but he was a blessing to me. But I, And I took it. But he said some, uh, he said some things. And he said, the reason I'm calling you is you have some influence um, in the in not just in our area but influence in our nation uh, just the years of traveling and preaching to young people and different things for whatever reason the Lord has 
uh, you know, let me do a few things that I never dreamed of ever doing. And he said, and before he could get it out of his mouth, I said, hold on, brother. Hold on a second. Everything that you just said, it's to God be the glory. I want you to know that you're saying some things that I never thought would ever come out of your mouth. I'm humbled and, and I'm, you know, I guess you could say humanly flattered a little bit that you would say that. But I said, brother, it's, it is literally, and I'm not just saying this because of it's, it's a little phrase. It's to God be the glory. Praise the Lord that you even think that way toward me, that you would even pick the phone up and feel comfortable enough to, to call me about this situation. It was honestly, if I told you what it was, you'd laugh. But still, it, would, it, it was big to him. And he, he said, well, you know, and I thought myself, a lot of you are dying. You know, Preacher, what is it? And I ain't going to tell you. Amen. Amen. Brother Wes will put it on YouTube. Amen. <laughs> and I don't want to ruin a good message like that. Amen. So I don't want to do that. Or run a good Bible study, rather. So I, I was I was thinking myself, though, uh, you know, what he was saying, it could easily, honestly, it could easily puff somebody's head up and say, boy, look, I've arrived. This guy, he... If I mention his name, some of you may even know him. Mean, he's a he's a pretty and he said some nice things. I must be the big shot now. Uh, I must be the man. Oh no, friend! We start thinking about that. We're about to be destroyed because pride will destroy anybody. Pride is always the problem. You trace any sin and the crime scene, you'll find pride. That's where it's at. So I had to literally confess to God, God, I'm sorry after this conversation, if there's any pride in me over what this man said, please get it out of me. And then I went and seen my wife and it, it did. It left real quick. She makes sure I'm beat down pretty good. I'm joking. She's a good wife. Then uh, number three, uh, uh, number three, I'll pay for it here in a little while. Number three, our praise our praise adds nothing to God. Now listen to this. Our praise adds nothing to God. It simply acknowledges Him for who He is. Hey, God is everything, so how can we add to God? God is everything, so how can we... Oh, if I praise God enough, He's... No, 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 no. God, uh, listen, God doesn't need our praise to exist. God already exists and He's all-powerful and omni omniscient and omnipresent and uh, omnipotent and He's all-knowing and all-wonderful. But when we praise God, it really benefits us. Yes. Amen. We're just acknowledging for who He is. But guess who it's really helping? It's helping us. Because what we're guilty of a lot of times is we're guilty of walking around deserving praise and looking for praise when we should just be directing it to God. So many people in the church want recognition, but it's for self-service. So we will do things in the church, but we want a pat on the back. We do. I mean... I'm, I'm, it, we're all guilty of it at some point. We're guilty of it, and we we oh preacher was that was that good enough? Or uh, I've even gotten the car before and said, "Honey, did I preach good tonight?" Or what was what I was? And really, the Holy Spirit, are you preaching to please? What if she says it ain't good? What if somebody walked out and said, "Preacher, that was the worst I've ever heard you." Who I should pleases him i shouldn't be going around taking a poll and saying now how was that good was that good all right tonight was that okay you know preacher did i help you tonight it should be i did what god wanted me to do whether it pleased the people or not now i've been in a few places before where i preached something and i thought these people going to stone me after the service <laughs> because again it's not up to me it's up to the lord we're supposed to preach the word of god and please him and then lastly, uh, if you're breathing, you owe God your praise. According to the psalmist, when he said, let everything that hath, pray, uh, let, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So if you're breathing tonight, if you're in this service, you owe God your praise. Well, by you coming to church tonight, you say, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me come to Bible Baptist, letting me come to prayer meeting, letting me come to Bible study, be with saints, be with others, 
and praise the Lord for what He's done. Praise the Lord. We made it a family tradition years ago, and we do it in our family. Every Christmas morning we get up. Many, I'm sure many families, um, you know, kids run down the stairs and they uh, sit around and they, you know, a lot of times they'll just dive right into the presence. <clears throat> what we've done for years, though, and I'm sure some, many of you probably do this as well, is we'll sit around and we'll uh, um, open up the Bible, start reading the, the uh, Luke's account of, of the Christmas story of, of, of Jesus Christ. We start reading Luke chapter 2 and we read it and then, then we, we go to each kid and we, you know, what are you thankful for? And do you have something to praise? I'm talking about all of them and what, we, what we're thankful for and what we thank God for, presenting things back to the Lord. And then we pray. And we acknowledge the one that is the giver. We acknowledge the one that even lets us have, that we could wake up because there's many families that, like we mentioned tonight, They'll be at a funeral home this week. When we got so much to praise God for. Hey, when's the last time you praised God for your church? When's the last time you praised God for uh, 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 for uh, living in America? For living in this country with all her problems. It's still the greatest country in all the world. Amen? Hey, when's the last time you praised God for having food on the table and 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 drinks in the refrigerator, and uh, we able to cook a meal. A lot of times we just don't we don't think about things, and we need to praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Hey, Jude ends it. I'm talking. He ends it, and buddy, he says, "Amen." He agrees with everything. Amen. And Jude is a it's a tough little book. I mean, it's not always magnifying the Lord. It's plowing. But he ends it with thanksgiving, praising the Lord, winning souls, and then giving glory back to God. Isn't that something? Pulling men out of the fire. And we ought to, listen, we ought to glean. Now, we come back next Wednesday, of course, once you be in your place, and, uh, and, and we'll start a new study. And I've already been working on some of that, so we'll present that the first of the year. And we'll stay in the Word of God. Uh, Ruth, we're in the book of Ruth on Sunday mornings. Now, this Sunday morning will be a little different being Christmas. I'm going to preach a uh, more of a uh, Christmas message the Lord's laid on my heart. You don't want to miss it. I think it'll be unique. And then um, and then we'll pick up next Sunday and preach on Ruth and uh, on, on the first of the year. And we'll keep continuing that. And then 1 Thessalonians on Sunday nights. And uh, God has blessed the preaching of His Word. And He has helped this preacher. Because I need it as much as you do. And I praise the Lord for it. And so I thank